trying to think what some thoughts are. Okay, it's 5.15. Who's ready? Ready? Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to the Executive Order N-2920 issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 12th, 2020. Any or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Sassoon Central Office, 2490 Gilborn Road, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Board members will state their name when they make the motion and when they make the second. All votes will re be recorded via roll call format. If my connection uh, is uh, terminated or fails, uh, Board Vice President John Silva will run the meeting. May I have the roll call, please? John Gott. Unmute your mic. I did. Here. Okay. Judy Honeychurch. Here. David <laughs> Eisen. David Eisen. Jonathan Richardson. Here. John Silva. Here. Bethany Smith. Craig Wilson. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? The closed oh. session agenda. So moved, John Silva. Is there a second? Second, Craig Wilson. Roll call, please. John Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We will now be adjourning to closed session to uh, discuss and have possible action on matters of student discipline, personnel, negotiations, and litigation. We are now, oh, do we have any public comment on closed session items? Superintendent Corey. It looks like she just left the meeting. She might have had a technical error. Okay, I will assume then that there's no uh, comment on closed session and we will adjourn and meet for closed session.
Hey, Joan, we can see everything that's going on in your house. You're eating and Dave's walking around behind you. I just wanted you to know that. And now we see you. President Honeychurch on the call. <laughs> she is, we, I saw her just a second ago. There she is. There she is. Uh, yes, my lights went off in the office up here. And so Ken had to turn them back on for me. <laughs> All righty, are we ready to go? <laughs> Good evening. This meeting is being held pursuant to Executive Order N2920 issued by California Governor Gavin Newsom on March 20, uh, March 12th, 2020. Any or, or, or all board members may attend the meeting by phone. Members of the public may attend at the Fairfield Saskatoon Central Office, 2490 Hillborn Road, Fairfield, California, to observe and provide public comment during the meeting. Board members will state their name when they make the motion and when they make the second. All votes will be recorded via roll call format. If my connection to the meeting fails, Board Vice President John Silva will run the meeting. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, Ms. Corey, could we please have the report of action taken in closed session? And yes, in the matter of conference with labor negotiators, no action was taken. In the matter of pending litigation, by unanimous decision, the board approved the settlement agreement in the matter of Office of Administrative Hearings, OAH, case number 2020. 010470. In the matter of public employment, by unanimous vote, the board has officially appointed Arlene um, Gainier Martinez as mental health clinician effective July 1st, 2020. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Arlene. 
She will be providing behavior management services, including counseling, supervision, crisis intervention, consultation, and outreach to general education students at uh, four of our schools in the district. We are excited to have her join us because she is well prepared to support and serve our school communities. She joins us from West Contra Costa, where she served as a social work specialist since December 2017. As a licensed clinical social worker, she has extensive experience in supporting the psychological growth of individuals in crisis and trauma. She understands the importance of teamwork and collective support. Ms. Gainier, uh, I hope I said that right, Gainier Martinez earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology and Social Behavior and English from UC Irvine. She earned her Master's of Science degree in Social Work from the University of Hawaii. And on behalf of the whole entire management team and the governing board, we are pleased to have you join our um, association. Welcome and congratulations. And then the other item is yours. Yes. Uh, in closed session, we finalized Superintendent Corey's yearly goals and evaluation for the upcoming year. It was a positive evaluation. And that, does that conclude the? There is no other action taken in closed session. Thank you. Um, I do have a short opening statement. Uh, in light of everything happening in our nation, I just want to say how grateful we are for the partnerships we have with our community and the community organizations. We'll now move on to um, recognitions and we will be recognizing child nutrition department and I will turn it over to Tim Gorey. Hi, yes, yeah, thank you. Um, the board church and uh, superintendent Corey, board, community, staff, um, it's a pleasure to be here to recognize our child nutrition department for the excellent work that they have done, especially over the last couple of months. I have here in my hands a proclamation of appreciation that I will deliver myself to the department. Um, but I would like to read it first. It says, whereas the governing board of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District strives to maintain safe, safe welcoming, and supportive learning environments. And whereas the board appreciates the outstanding efforts of the child nutrition department for their bravery, hard work, and great diligence during school closures associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the board values the work of the child nutrition department, which included 282,840 meals served free to all children from March 16th through June 12th of 2020 in challenging physical conditions in which safety was a grave concern for students, families, and staff. And whereas the board acknowledges the Child Nutrition Department for working with various government agencies and vendors to deliver compliant food to children when compliance became nearly impossible and regular vendors could not deliver. And whereas the board is grateful that the child nutrition department showed uncommon perseverance and skill by reworking their processes and procedures to deliver meals to children in a safe and efficient way. And whereas the governing board of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District desires to formally acknowledge the child nutrition department for its excellent support of our students, staff, schools, and community. Now, therefore, Judy Honeycher, our president, does hereby proclaim the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District Governing Board's sincere and honest gratitude to the Child Nutrition Department in witness thereof, proclaimed this 18th day of June 2020 in Fairfield, California. Now, uh, normally, at this time, if we were in person, we would ask any any uh, child nutrition department employees to come up to the front to be recognized. And obviously, we can't do that. But um, I have created a, a small video that I think is going to work here. I hope. Um, hold on as I take over from the broadcasting team.
And please make sure that you're, uh, you're on mute so that this doesn't create feedback. And that is our best replacement for bringing people up and, and giving them a hand for what they, what they have done. Um, I believe we have Dan Mitchell, the Director of Child Nutrition, uh, on the call. Dan, uh, do you have a few words? I do, Tim. Thank you very much for that great uh, video, first of all. And, and thank you to President uh, Honeychurch, uh, Superintendent Corey, and the entire board for recognizing our department. Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that I get to work with such a tremendous group of people in my department that, that care so much about the children that they serve all the, all of the time. And really, to be, to be fair, I, I want to thank my department, but it wasn't just our department. Uh, especially when this first started, we had a lot of staffing issues, uh, and we had volunteers from administration, from the maintenance department, teachers were volunteering crossing guards, everybody was wanting to help out and making sure that we could get meals out to kids. Uh, and I can tell you, this is the third district that I've worked in with the child nutrition department. And I don't think the other districts I worked in would have had that type of team effort uh, the way we did. So uh, we're very fortunate uh, to work amongst the group of people that we have in this district. And I'm very, very thankful for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. We do indeed have an excellent department and group of people here at, at our district that really all chip in and help when help is needed. Uh, move on to B, written report, annual report on FSUSD professional development. There's no presentation. Do we have any public comment? There is no public comment. Thank you. Any board discussion on this item? Okay, move on to C, presentation and update on the program description for the Virtual Academy Fair for so soon. Uh, Melissa Farrar, uh, first of all, do we have any public comment? There is no public comment. Okay, and I will now turn it over to Melissa. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch, Governing Board. Give me just one second to get my presentation up and running. Ah. The fun parts about clicking the wrong button. <laughs> Good evening. Um, I am here tonight to talk to you about the update on the Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon. Our committee has been working on the program description and we wanted to be able to share some additional information with you and the community about our virtual school. The Virtual Academy of Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District offers a homeschool option for students in grades kindergarten through eighth grade. In this unique school, students work on grade level state standards with guidance and support from a credentialed teacher. Students progress Progress is monitored and families are given assistance with hands-on learning and the best educational practices. The Virtual Academy is a, highly, is a high quality educational choice for 
FSUSD families, ensuring equitable access to instruction and progress monitoring so that the parent and guardian is fully aware of their student's progress. Students are expected to participate every day in the live synchronous instruction. There will be services for special education students determined by the IEP team and students that are designated as English learners will participate in designated English learner support program and lessons. As you can see, we've outlined um, a little bit more information about our grades K through two program. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions about how long will each of these things be and how many hours will that look like for my student. So for our K2 program, again, it'll be, we anticipate it being five hours of live synchronous instruction with 10 hours of other forms of small group instruction, one-on-one, -on -one, tutoring um, types of things. We know our students um, in large groups at younger grades online might struggle with attention. And so we wanted to be able to break that time up for our younger students to be able to give them more intensive small group interactions. In our three through five program, the time kind of is split evenly in between um, our whole group instruction and then our large group instruction or small group instruction, excuse me, um, between seven and eight hours, depending on um, on the whole group or small group. So kind of split down the middle. And then with our sixth through eighth grade program, we anticipate um, because the lessons are a little bit more complex and go into a lot greater detail, we wanted to be able to have some in additional time for the whole group instruction. So we're recommending 10 hours and then still having time for that small group um, or one-on-one -on -one kind of instruction at five hours. In addition to that, all students at all grade levels can be expected to participate in an additional 10 hours of independent or family facilitated learning. And this would be learning that parents or families would be supporting. Um, the teacher would be providing and or directing that learning, but it would be um, that asynchronous learning where it's happening it, um, at an individual time frame, So it might not be the same amount of time every day, um, but there will be recommendations for that moving forward. This is also the place where our PE or physical education instruction will happen um, so that we can make sure that we're, all of our students are meeting their requisite mission minutes. Um, but it could change um, in terms of topics. So sometimes it might be um, science or history, but other times there might be additional support activities for English language arts or math. Again, there would be for art or music activity instruction. Um, and as the grade levels advance, maybe some more self-selected activities from the students to be able to plan some individualized learning of their own. We did talk about this being um, a program that would also have opportunity for social interaction and community learning. Um, our children, we know, need an opportunity to be a part of a group even when they are learning from home. So field trips and socialization activities will provide that time for, for students to be a part of a group and have a fun learning experience together. We hope and anticipate that families will be able to participate um, with their student in some of these activities. And at this time, we're anticipating they be scheduled once a month. And again, that might flex in the early portions of this program, depending on what we're able to do as a community um, based off of local health regulations. I did want to make, take a quick second to mention that this program will participate in all the district and state assessments. Um, we will make arrangements for families to be able to, to help make sure that their students are available for that progress monitoring that we do. But I wanted to just thank you for the opportunity to let you know on our updates. You need to unmute. Unmute. I always forget, I always forget to do that. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Is there are there any comments? Uh, I can. May I? Uh, let me see. On slide six, I think it was. 
any uh, PE or art or music, those would be either independent or with the family. Is that correct? Chris, did you want me to handle that? Yeah. Yes, please, sorry. <laughs> um, those are some of the things that could be. Now that's not to say that every time art instruction or music instruction or PE would be on an independent basis, but those would be activities that potentially would be um, facilitated by the family. There might be specific opportunities where there needs to be um, some whole class or small group instruction for any of those topics. And that could be utilized during the appropriate time. It's just um, some ideas. We wanted to make sure that the core content was um, was really addressed in those in-person activities, um, but we also recognize that there is some specific need for um, our additional subject areas to have some of that face time, if you will, um, teaching time as well. So they're just there are a little bit of guidelines at the moment, but what we anticipate the div or the distribution of time being. Good, thank you. That answers my question. Okay. Any other questions or comments, board members? Okay. Is I don't see Jonathan. Jonathan, did you have any questions? No, I see Jonathan. No. Okay. May I, I ask a question, please? Yes. Okay. Um, when you're talking about the virtual academy, will students have the opportunity to come back onto the campus for anything specific, such as the after school band program? Just like any of the students in our district, they will, they are our district students, so they will be able to participate in district activities as. Um, as outlined by other board policies, but things that are specific to individual schools, their individual school will be the virtual school. So anything that the virtual school might set up for a school specific activity would be something they would be connected to. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to D, presentation, reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year, part two. Do we have any public speakers on this item? Yes, we have two public speakers, Jim Bastian and George Curry. Okay. Just like this, this thing. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Oh, there's some feedback. Okay. okay. All right. Well, good evening, FSUSD board, uh, Superintendent Corey, esteemed audience members, uh, and my fellow Fairfield and Sassoon City parents, guardians, and family members. No politics tonight, science. Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. De Dr. Deborah Burks have said, physically distance six feet or more, wear face coverings in public places where distancing is difficult, avoid large gatherings, wash or sanitize your hands often, don't touch your face. Vice Admiral Dr. Jerome Adams, the United States Surgeon General, physically distance, Wear face coverings, avoid large gatherings, wash or sanitize your hands often, don't touch your face. Numerous doctors and experts we've all heard ad infinitum for the past five, six months, right? Physically distance, wear face coverings, avoid large gatherings, wash or sanitize your hands often and don't touch your face. FSUSD plan for reopening schools in August Wash or sanitize your hands often, that's good. Don't touch your face. No physical distancing. 
put 34 or more students in a 900 square foot classroom with a teacher, the students are about two feet apart from one another. No mandatory face coverings for students. Well, that might change now with what's happened today, uh, mandated by the governor. And no avoidance of large gatherings. I would say that uh, 34 students with a teacher in a room, 900 or 1,000 square feet is a pretty large gathering. Does that seem logical or safe or wise? I think not. A little bit reckless to me. So no politics, follow the science. Let's take care with the health of students and staff. Come back in August with a wise, logical plan to ed educate our students safely. Now, just as I had finished writing this, Governor Newsom issued an order requiring Californians to wear masks, those over two years old. Um, on June 8th and 9th, I know the county allowed more businesses to reopen, including uh, where my wife works in a hair salon, but with very, very restrictive uh, restrictions. For example, their clients must wait in their cars until they're allowed in by a cosmetologist. Only the client receiving services allowed in the shop, no companions, six in the room, five cosmetologists and about in one client for each cosmetologist are the most that can be in there. All must wear face coverings at all times. When they're having something done to the side of their head, they have to have their masks taped on. No refreshments are served, no magazines. They have to clean the doorknobs and the bathrooms in the bathroom every time it's used. My point, my point is that 35 people in a 900 square foot room for hours at a time is not reasonable. 74% of parents in the survey ranked as important or very important social distancing. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is George Curry. I'm a, I've been a member or resident of Fairfield since 1992. My family's been here since the 60s. Um, I have nephews, nieces. Um, in fact, my son just graduated from Army Hill yesterday, so I want to give a shout out to the unique um, challenge that. Um, the graduating class of 2020 has gone through. I wasn't thinking of speaking today, but one of the reasons that, to give you some context of why I wanted to speak was the fact that being at Grange, at least the information that had been passed on to us as we've been working and coming out of our remote teaching, which had its challenges. And I was impressed with how well, at least the teachers that I worked with at Grange were able to provide meaningful um, teaching. But one of the things I was concerned about is that what has been what had been directed to us for weeks was the indication that we were we were going to be going to a hybrid model, um, something whether or not in terms of smaller cohorts, with the express purpose of having being able to have smaller classes and have um, social distancing. So even as of late as last Thursday, that information was still being passed on to, to us. And then what kind of caught me off guard was the fact of um, Superintendent Corey's um, letter on Friday saying that, hey, the plan and presentation going forward was for a full reopening as normal as possible. So I'm looking forward to what the staff presentation is gonna be and the board presentation in conversation as to there's a lot that can fit into what as is normal as possible. So. Going some of the things that Jim had, 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 um, had addressed is, again, I'm trying to see from the standpoint of what is normal as possible putting 30 kids into a classroom. Um, one of my concerns or one of the things that's come out was the California Department of Public Health's 15-page document that came out on June 5th, as well as State Superintendent Thurman's 55-page um, document that came out earlier this week. But in both of those documents, they really focus on having smaller cohorts as well as having social distancing within a classroom. So does as normal as possible going to address that? I'm not sure. So I'm very much looking forward to your discussion and um, how in fact we're going to proceed um, in terms of trying to maintain both the safety of the students 
the safety of the teachers and staff, as well as the safety of those people that we that we live with. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. There are no more public speakers on this item. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Kristen Mitt. Thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Corey, Board President Honeychurch, Governing Board members, and members of the community. I'm happy to be here this evening to update the Governing Board and the public on the reopening of schools for the 2021 school year. And this is our second update to the public and the board. Please give me a moment to pull up the presentation. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Superintendent Corey, who will provide you with an overview of the COVID-19 related decisions and timeline from March 3rd to the present. Thank you. Next slide, please. These next slides are gonna show just exactly what we've been through since March 4th. On March 4th, our governor declared a state of emergency. This all caught our attention. And we wondered what would happen with our schools under this state of emergency. A little over a week later, Deerfield Sassoon made the very difficult decision to close school for two weeks. At that time, we thought we're gonna close for two weeks and we're gonna reopen. You can see a couple days later, the decision that happened at the California state level. Three days later, we started sharing resources with online um, services because we thought we're gonna have two weeks of closure. We need our parents to be informed. And then you can see March 17th, which was only four days after our first announcement of closure, we extended the closures um, and we started looking at reopening after spring break. Once again, thinking through this time frame, we get a handle on what was happening. You can see then how quickly things changed um, with the Solano County offer of the shelter in place and then the statewide shelter in place. Next slide, please. So by the end of March, we had our distance learning plan initiated and the stay at home order was extended. And then on April 1st, Governor Newsom made the announcement that his expectation was that schools um, and students would not return through the remainder of the school year. On February or April 9th, following our a uh, board meeting uh, that made the graduation requirements temporarily modified. We also came to the conclusion that we were going to remain closed for the end of the 2019-2020 school year. So you can see how quickly things in just one month's time. Then you can see how things um, happened through the month of April. People we need to respect. We learned a lot more about what the about the virus, about safety issues, and how we could safely reopen. Go to the next slide, please. On May 8th, California started reopening stores with curbside pickup. And on May 21st, we approved our virtual school. Because really at that time, we still thought maybe we would be closed all next year. We didn't know what the future held. And so we wanted to have a, a very viable option with our virtual school. On May 25th, the state started allowing churches with large gatherings to reopen stores for in-shopping and then on um, May 27th, 
you can see that hair salons, hair salons and barber shops were reopening. They were all reopening with some guidelines that they had in order to reopen. Can go to the next slide, please. This time we were starting to think, gosh, maybe we can reopen. Maybe we aren't going to be doing distance learning in the fall. And so we wanted to really look at some of those safety precautions and ask our parents and our community, which of these are the utmost importance to you? Because we want to remember that there have been no guidelines or no mandate from the state. There are no mandates from our California Department of Education. There are guidelines and every district has the decision as to how they are going to implement those guidelines. And so that is really important to note because every school district in the state of California is in a different place. Depending on which county you're in, you have very different statistics and other guidelines that um, are happening. So if you go through on June 4th, we started having a conversation about what that hybrid model might look like. This was June 4th. We presented to the governing board that option of potentially having some type of hybrid model. Maybe kids come back a couple of days a week. Other kids come back a, a couple more days. And then a mere four or five days later, suddenly our county is saying, you know what? We're going to open our gyms, our wineries, our family entertainment centers, our hotels, our restaurants for, for um, dining. And we were faced with this question of people can go to an entertainment center, if they can go to a bar, if they can go to a winery and a gym, why can't they come back to school? We listened to a lot of our families who said, and our staff members, who um, said a hybrid model would actually be very difficult. And one of the things we did take into consideration is the ask. We asked our teachers to, within two weeks time, go from teaching how they knew how to teach in a classroom setting to implementing distance learning. And now it's the end of the school year and we were thinking, are we gonna really ask again over the course of this summer for you to learn about a hybrid blended teaching model, we need to figure out how we could safely return to school. This to me is our best option at this point in time. I was a, a parent of three kids, single parent, raising them by myself, and I started trying to think in my mind, how would I handle it if I'm working full time, my family lives 2000 miles away, and what if one of my children is going on a Monday, Tuesday, my other child is going on a Thursday, Friday, how would I manage that and how would I, I, I handle that? And so I, I thought about just how many of our families have working parents. And that was one of the impetus things, but most importantly, our kids need us. Our kids need us five days a week. We heard time and time again of how distance learning didn't work. There was not accountability, that there were some kids that showed up every day, but a lot didn't. And so we felt strongly about seeing at this point in time, let's figure out how to reopen and do school like we know how to do it with safety precautions. June 12th our school year ended. You can go on to the next slide, please. And this is really important to note. Since that very first day when the governor said, there's a state of emergency to the end of our school year, that was a hundred days. And look how fast and quickly things changed. And we had to react and we had to adjust. From now, today, until the start of school is 62 days. We know that things may change. We know that we may have to adjust. But at this point in time, June 18th, 2020, it is our recommendation that we move forward for August or the August start with a full reopening. 
Next slide, and I am going to now turn it over to um, Dr. McCabe. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. I think this next slide that is up right now um, visually displays what Superintendent Corey was just speaking about in terms of the fact that from that March 4th date until August 19th, we're, we're just over 50% of the way of that time period, and we know that things will change over the next um, 62 days. Next slide. When we return from spring break, our district put together a return to school committee to develop plans for the start of the 2020-2021 school year. Superintendent Corey and Mrs. Witt have provided updates regarding the composition and discussions of this group. In conducting their research and reviewing federal, state, and local guidelines, the committee outlined five phases, which mirror that process of, of phase implementation at the state and county level. As the committee work has continued, we realize that these phases are more of a continuum as we may find the need to move up or down the phases during the course of this upcoming school year. Again, we think of this more like a continuum where we might be in phase four, some schools might be in phase two, some schools might be in, in different phases. Next slide. The final three months of the 2021-1920 school year, the district was operating in phase one with 100% distance learning. However, as we enter the summer, which Mrs. Witt will be sharing momentarily, we'll be operating in phase three with a combination of distance learning programs and in-person programs. In addition to the in-person programs being a requirement for one of our grant-funded summer programs, we believe that this will be a great opportunity to have some of our children and staff back in the classroom on a much smaller scale than what we um, anticipate will take place in August. I'd now like to turn it back over to Mrs. Witt so she can outline the upcoming summer program. Thank you, Dr. McCabe. The closure of our school buildings and the move to a distance learning format has had an impact on our students. We want to do all that we can to minimize the summer slide or learning loss. Summer slide or learning loss is the tendency for students, especially those from low income families, to lose some of the achievement gains they made during the previous school year. Existing literature emphasizes the effectiveness of summer reading programs at slowing the learning loss. This summer, we are providing multiple opportunities for students across the district to remain engaged with their learning. Our high school credit recovery program started yesterday, and we are serving over 425 10th through 12th graders. Students are remediating credits that are needed for graduation. This year, students are participating via a distance learning format. Students are accessing their credit recovery classes through our online platform, Edgenuity for all of the classes except for PE. PE is being taught by one of our high school PE teachers, and she has developed lessons that blend both individual student physical activities and Google Classroom synchronous lessons. We will be serving 50 students in our Kinder Ready program that is designed for students that have not attended any preschool with a focus on serving second language learners. The program is funded by a first five grant that we have had for many years. This year, we are serving 50 students, half as many as we normally serve due to social distancing in the classes. Students will attend Monday through Thursday. Additionally, 72 second and third graders will engage with reading and writing each day in our elementary Jumpstart program. Jumpstart is for second and third grade students that are not on grade level. It is funded through our Title I funds. Its major focus is on reading and writing, but there is math review each day as well. This year, we will have seven classes that are serving 72 students. Our Title I schools extended school year programs will serve a total of 200 students combined. At Grange and, Middle, at Grange and Crystal Middle Schools, they are running Read 180 courses, serving incoming sixth graders that are in need of additional support in reading comprehension. They are also running Math Camp, replicating last year's program using the board adopted curriculum. Students will get approximately two and a half hours of instruction and teachers will participate in two hours of professional development and collaborative planning daily with a math coach providing feedback. We are happy to have FSUSD admin and teachers serving in the roles of the math coaches. We are able to capitalize on the internal capacity 
that has been developed over the last few years. The 2019-20 special education extended school year runs from June 17th through July 15th using a distance learning format similar to services provided over the past three months. 115 students from preschool through post-secondary are participating in a four hour a day session for five days a week for a total of 20 days. Services offered include specialized academic instruction, occupational therapy, speech and language, and individual counseling. The ESY is designed as a maintenance program and determined as a part of a student's individualized education plan based on prior years, significant regression and recoupment. Our elementary literacy camp will serve 80 students with in-person instruction for students in rising first and second grade. There will be a focus on teaching foundational literacy skills using effective instructional practices with adopted curriculum. Like math camp last year, students will get approximately two and a half hours of instruction. Teachers are team teaching and participating in two hours of professional development daily with the idea that they then might be able to serve as model classrooms for strong foundational literacy instruction next year. We are very excited about something brand new for summer 2020. Distance learning opportunities for kindergarten through eighth grade students from June 29th through August 7th. These short courses offer a variety of learning topics and experiences for students ranging from two to six weeks in length. They include online sessions through Google Meet and independent offline activities. Teachers will also be available each week for office hours. Students may sign up for one or more courses based on the avail their availability and interest and time. We have 32 different courses to do so. Some examples include story time for kindergarten through second graders. Anyone can cook, read a story and cook with me for students in grades second through fifth. Girls on the Run for students in grades third through fifth, and Lights, Camera, Action, Bring Ordinary Stories to Life with iMovie for students in fifth through eighth grade. Each of these courses were developed by our teachers for our students this summer. We were not able to proceed with our annual STEM camp this year, but we are excited about the STEAM opportunity that is available to 40 students in grades six through eight, led by expert teachers who had designed the camp with interaction from home and mind it will include a physical kit integrated into the virtual activities that will be mailed to the student's home. This way, we are calling the camp hybrid. While students will participate from home, there will be physical elements in the activities. This camp is provided absolutely free to the students who are accepted into the program. As we worked on our plans for reopening schools in August, it was essential that we also plan for our high school and middle school sports programs. High school athletics engages each year in summer conditioning. Staff developed a draft return to play plan on June 10th. Just two days later, the California Interscholastic Federation or CIF announced guidelines for returning to physical activity and training in preparation for playing sports in the upcoming school year. Additionally, after several days of meetings with commissioners from states and 10 section, the state's 10 sections, the CIF said in a press release on Friday that it will determine by July 20th if fall, if fall sports will continue as currently scheduled. The CIF is prepared to offer alternative calendars if it is determined by that date that fall sports may not as start as scheduled due to ongoing public health and safety concerns. Staff met on June 17th to revise our FSUSD return to play plan. We anticipate having our plan finalized by the beginning of the week with anticipated plans to begin some form of athletic summer conditioning in July. Our return to play plan includes each of the categories outlined in the guidelines from the CIF. The elements included in our return to play plan outline all of the coaching requirements, including certifications and training that need to be completed by each coach prior to beginning any conditioning with athletes. Student and parent guardian requirements, including athletic participation packet documentation and sports physicals. Protocols on cleaning facilities and equipment that may be used. Protocols for daily individual screening and recording of information for each and prior to conditioning each day. Protocols for entering and exiting the facilities. Protocols that outline the necessary hygiene practices for both coaches and athletes. Protocols for hydration and food, including the use of individual water bottles only 
and no shared water fountains or troughs. Face coverings are highly recommended to be worn by both coaches and athletes. Explicit protocols of what types of physical activities and which equipment are allowed broken down for each sport. There are guidelines for the number of spectators, which will be updated as new guidance is provided by Solano County Public Health. Again, all coaches will need to complete training on the entirety of the return to play plan, in addition to completing all certifications, which include but are not limited to CPR, first aid, AED, fundamentals of coaching, and heat illness prevention. As I mentioned in my presentation at the June 4th governing board meeting, we wanted to gather feedback and input from our parents and guardians and staff to understand what safety recommendations they had as their highest priorities. We received a total of 3,229 responses to our English parent and guardian survey, 176 responses to our Spanish parent and guardian survey. We had a relatively small response from our staff with only 145 staff members responding. There was definitely consistency between the responses from the parents and guardians and the staff of FSUSD. The top three safety recommendations that received the highest priority ranking on both the parent and staff survey were temperature, temperature, excuse me, temperature checks at home, receiving 73% of the parents responding and 68.4% of staff responding, ranking this recommendation as a five or extremely important. 87% of the parents responding and 85% of the staff responding ranked hand washing throughout the day as a five or extremely important. And 87% of parents responding and 94% of staff responding ranked hand sanitizer availability for staff and students as a five or extremely important. All three of these safety recommendations that both parents and guardians and staff ranked as extremely important are included in our safety protocols that will be part of our reopening in August. I will discuss the safety protocols in more depth later in this presentation. Dr. McCabe will now take a few moments to review the continuum of the reopening plan. Thank you, Ms. Witt. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we are working from the assumption that we have to have a continuum of teaching and learning delivery models and based on the work from our very comprehensive reopening school committee, we have a five phase continuum. The challenge in this work is that the committee is not planning for today. We are planning for 62 days from today. And as Superintendent Corey pointed out, based on the last 100 days, a lot can change in the next 62 days. Next slide. Over the last few months, staff have been reviewing federal, state, and local guidelines, studying the reopening plan being carried out in California and Solano County, and determining the potential safety protocols for each of the phases on the continuum. Based on the rate that the state and county are reopening, as well as those other items that Superintendent Corey mentioned earlier in this presentation, we believe that it's appropriate for our families and staff to anticipate and plan for a phase four reopening to take place 62 days from today. While 100% of the instruction will happen in person, by no means will this be back to normal. Explicit safety precautions will be in place to minimize the risk to staff, students, and families. Mrs. Witt is now going to discuss those safety precautions. Thank you, Dr. McCabe. According to a news release by the American Academy for Pediatrics on June 2nd, 2020, quote, the risk of COVID-19 transmission among groups of children has not been well studied, but current research suggests that the risk is much lower than the adult population. The negative effects of missing in-person educational time as children experience prolonged periods of isolation and lack of instruction, however, is clear. Children rely on schools for multiple needs, including but not limited to education, nutrition, physical activity, socialization, and mental health. Special populations of students receive services for disabilities and other conditions that are virtually impossible to deliver online. Prolonging a meaningful return to in-person education 
would result in thousands of children in the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District being at risk for worsening academic, developmental, and health outcomes. Staff's recommendation for the 2020-2021 school year is to reopen campuses with safety precautions that minimize risk to our best efforts possible and implement a continuum if necessary. We believe our students need to return back to school five days a week to ensure they are getting the best educational experience possible. This is in many ways is an equity issue. We already have a significant achievement gap in our district. We want to ensure our students are not also subjected to an educational accessibility gap. Our staff also took into consideration that many of our families and employees who work full time would find a hybrid model very problematic. It concerns us that our children could be left home alone, uh, alone, unsupervised. We recognize that not all parents and guardians will be comfortable sending their children back to the school buildings in August. Parents concerned about sending their child back to school with our traditional reopening for the 2020-2021 school year can access our virtual school or long-term independent study program. Providing options for our families has always been a cornerstone of the Fairfield Sassoon School District, and it is no different during this time. We now have the newly developed virtual school as an available option for students in grades K through eight. And additionally, for any family that wants to continue with a distance learning for format for their high school child, we have the option of long-term independent study. The health and safety of our students, staff, and families are of the utmost importance. When the 2020-2021 school year begins in the Fairfield Sassoon School District, the on-campus school day may look much different than previous years due to new COVID-19 health and safety measures. Our plan to reopen schools is based on guidance from state and local public health officials. As we have mentioned throughout our presentation this evening, our plans will be updated as the situation evolves. It is important to note that our plan must focus sharply on academic instruction to enhance student performance and addressing learning loss. Before students and staff come to school, they will be asked to conduct a self-screening for signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Parents and guardians should assist younger children with the screening, and any student or staff member with a temperature over 100.3 will remain home. Physical and social distancing helps limit the spread of the virus. Students and staff will be asked to practice social distancing when and where applicable. Students and staff should wash their hands for 20 seconds with soap, rubbing thoroughly after application and use paper towels or single use cloths to dry hands thoroughly. Hand sanitizer should be used when hand washing is not practical and hand sanitizer will be made available. When we originally developed this presentation and finalized it yesterday, the recommendation was that staff and students would be highly encouraged to use face cloth, cloth face coverings. Earlier today, the governor issued an order that face coverings must be worn at all times when you are out in a public place. Of course, our recommendation would be to follow the state order if it is still in effect in August 2020. This is a perfect example of how the plans will need to be fluid and responsive to current conditions. The front office at each school site will be open by appointment only. Volunteers will not be allowed and there will be no additional adults beyond employees in the classroom. Each school site will develop internal schedules that will limit the amount of individuals at events and gatherings. And we will continue to work in cooperation with Solano County Public Health and use their guidelines as it relates to the recommended number of individuals at events and gatherings. Our maintenance and operations departments are revising cleaning schedules and hiring needed staff to provide a revamped cleaning schedule with increased cleaning frequency. Personal hygiene signage will be provided and hung throughout each campus. Field trips will not be planned for the start of the school year. There will be a uniform signs of illness response plan that will include as a component of the plan, sites identifying a location on their site for students that have COVID-19 symptoms to wait for their parent or guardian to pick them up. There will be a uniform response plan in place outlining the processes and procedures if an employee or student is confirmed with COVID-19. School sites will review their internal lunch schedules and stagger feeding times in partnership with Child Nutrition, who will staff appropriately 
to provide increased child nutrition schedules that will allow for a greater span of time for lunch service. Transportation will only be provided for students that have transportation in their individualized education plan. And we will also offer the option of in-lieu payment for any of those parents that agree to transport their own child. Dr. McKay will now take a few moments to recap the continuum of the reopening plan and our need for being flexible and fluid. We recognize that we've shared a significant amount of information in this presentation. One of the takeaways I wanna make certain you have is the following. Given the current set of circumstances and our state's movement to reopen, we believe opening the school year in August at phase four on the continuum is important and appropriate. In addition, staff will continue to monitor what is taking place in our county and our community and make adjustments as necessary. We may find over the course of the 2021 school year that schools and our classes have to move into a different place on the continuum, depending on the individual circumstances in a classroom or at a particular school. What, we can, what can be guaranteed is that we will continue to work with Solano County Public Health and Solano County Office of Education to ensure that the plans minimize the risk to our students, staff, and families. This concludes our presentation. President Honeychurch, I do have one other thing to add. Of course, go ahead. I just wanna point out that this plan does come at a cost. Um, we are hiring an additional custodian staff. I think we are looking at eight additional FTE so that we can ensure that our schools are cleaned every day. Um, we also know that we may be overstaffed because we don't know right now what our projections are in each school and if everybody's going to come back. And so we are planning for the projections that we had and staffing at that rate. We know that our class sizes might be smaller than usual because in regular years, we might take a class and combo them to be as close to that um, student maximum. And we're gonna have to be lenient about that. We do wanna ensure that we are practicing social distancing whenever possible. There are a lot of plans that we still, and details that we need to figure out in regards to um, where different students might be entering the campuses and exiting the campus. And we really need to look at how we can keep kids together in cohorts. Those are the details that we are gonna to continue to work on in the next 62 days. Thank you. Uh, any comments from board members? It is just mind boggling the planning that needs to be involved and the what ifs that may or may not happen. Um, any, any comments? I, I do. I primarily it's a question around, um, you know, as uh, Dr. McCabe had mentioned, it is a lot of information. And, um, you know, we didn't get this presentation until this afternoon, or at least I didn't have, uh, uh, I didn't see it until um, this afternoon. Uh, and unfortunately my work schedule didn't allow for a very thorough review. So I'm wondering, will we have another opportunity at digesting this information and then discussing it in an open session environment? Or is it something that if we have questions we need to come to Chris um, about? We'll, we'll still continue to give you updates. Now our plan is um, after today, we're gonna be sending out a questionnaire to our community of what questions they might have. And then we are going to be having a kind of virtual town hall meeting in which those questions will be asked of staff 
and that will be presented at 5.30 next Tuesday. We will again have an update about reopening schools on our, in our, at our July board meeting. And we plan on having another virtual town hall meeting with staff at the end of July as well. Okay, thank you. I'm, I may, um, based on my own personal situation, need to one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Um, I'll, I'll write down some questions and maybe email them to you for a later discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. Anybody else? Yeah, Judith, it's David. Um, okay, and then Craig. Thank you for this thorough presentation. And, and again, thank you for every single thing that has had to go into uh, the thought and the, the planning. You know, we're at over 55% free and reduced lunch. And that's very unfortunate where we are as a society. Um, speaks to some systemic stuff. However, when we're dealing with our children, first and foremost, we are going to do what is best for them, what is the safest uh, way to educate our kids. And we have to follow um, the guidelines that are put out by um, those health authorities, those who crunch the data that have it. And I don't know um, that a lot of people realize, but Pilato County, I don't know that they've ever told us to close schools, right? Um, I might be wrong in that, but if they did, it, it was not early on, um, and and our decision was based on what we believe would be best for our own kids. So I just want us to remember the process of that we've gone through, but the timeline of when our own county health officials, I don't know if Chris can answer that, I, I don't have it, have told us to, 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 to shut down schools, or even if they ever did. Um, so many of our students just depend on us. It's, it's, it's the only place that they, is safe for them. Um, violence is happening in homes. It always does. It always will. Um, children are victims of this. They're not uh, out and about seeing doctors. They're not uh, seeing teachers, mandatory reporters. So I can't imagine the amount of abuse cases that have gone up just because they're not being reported. Um, so so I, there's so many reasons that I know that we need to get back into the school, but I just wanna say, we're not going to do it haphazardly. We're not gonna do it in an unsafe manner. Thanks, David. Uh, Craig? Um, I'd like to say I fully support this plan as it is today even though I fully expect it to change in the next 62 days, the next 100 days, because the surprises aren't over. But this team will respond skillfully and capably. We'll get through it if we pull together. Uh, the alarm, uh, you know, I, since I've been home a lot, I read lots of media. There are lots of things that alarm me. And I doubt that I'm seeing anything that our team is seeing, and they're seeing a whole lot more. And if a, if a school or a grade level or the whole district drops down to phase three or phase two or phase one again, I would not be surprised in the least. And I would want these people making those decisions for us. As I understand, it's, it's not a board decision. We're being advised, and um, I like hearing how uh, the, the people on the team, the planners are thinking, and I have no doubt they will respond appropriately when surprises pop up. That's kind of how I see it. It's a best case plan. It's not a worst case. And it's a plan for now today because we need to have a plan, but it will flex and adapt. That's how I see it. That's all I had to say. Nicely said, Craig. I couldn't agree with you more. That's great. <laughs> Uh, John, did you have something to say? Yeah, I do. Uh, well, first, again, I, I would also like to uh, commend our, our team, uh, Ms. Witt and her, her team, that I, I do not envy the amount of work and planning that is going into something like this in the short notice. You know, we're, we're so used to doing things one way, and then we're shifting literally 360 degrees. Uh, I mean, 
want to say 180 degrees, but we're we're further than that into something that's so different that uh, you know, and and nobody knows what exactly will happen. And and I I realize that things are evolving, but uh, as far as the reopening, uh, I I was much more apprehensive about reopening yesterday than I am right now, and and uh, the 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 presentation was extremely informative and help and helpful, but mainly, um, and I've had this conversation before about masks. I mean, everything that, um, every, everything that the science, I'll call it, as everybody was calling it, our speakers were calling it, the science points to masks. Uh, you know, the hand washing, I think, is mostly a routine, but um, it, it's about masks. And, you know, the doctors, and nurses fighting this COVID fight uh, in the hospitals, they are not social distancing. They are physically covered, and, and most importantly, is you know where they breathe is through their mask. And if that's 100% covered, they're pretty safe. I'm not saying they're not exposed, but they are pretty safe. And our first speaker spoke to, uh, and I don't want to say quote it, but mentioned uh, Dr. Pauci and Dr. Burks. And I believe the order of uh, of what he mentioned was that uh, social distancing and when not possible, wear a mask. I don't believe it was social distancing and the mask that I heard. Uh, the masks take over. And as long as you're wearing one in close contact or preferably farther away, uh, that is what actually as the, 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 the large measure of safety uh, to this health issue. And now that Solano County and the state have issued the order to wear masks, you know, before we could, it was only optional. We could only tell people it was optional. I had a lot of problems with that. Uh, it, would yeah, yeah. Person, it would only take one person come to school that didn't want to wear a mask and said, you know, I don't have to, and I'm not going to. And you could make a lot of people sick. But now that person either wears a mask or they stay home. So I am feeling much better about the school opening when everybody now is mandated to wear a mask. They get out of their cars or get dropped off at school before they walk up through those doors, they have a mask on. And if they don't, they turn around or provide them with one, one or the other. But uh, so I, I think that the plan we have now, not only is a very complete plan, but with the mask aspect to me, gives it a, you know, the stamp of more flexibility in how we can do it and how we go about it. Because we do have children that uh, they're home alone. Not all of our parents, can take the time off to take care of their kids. We have kids that don't eat unless they're at school. The only meals they get. And so, you know, if they can't come to school, they're they're at a big disadvantage. Uh, I can only imagine the studies that are going to be happening for years to come, you know, 12 years from now when the kindergartners will have graduated and there's a big hole in the learning. Literally, a, not a huge hole, but a three-month hole in all this learning that didn't happen and what that will look like for those that are attending college in those times. But anyway, uh, you know, that was a, a pretty big ramble, but uh, I feel better about it now. Uh, our plan is pretty complete. I realize it, it's by no means concrete. It can we'll shift. Stop, well, stop rambling if you know you're rambling. <laughs> it, it can shift <laughs> at any minute and probably will. And we'll have to revisit it probably every two weeks, but that's what we'll do. And that's, Thank that's you. Uh, <laughs> Madam President. Oh, yes, Jonathan, go ahead. Um, I, I would just like to say or reiterate something that I had shared with the superintendent this week in regards to this. Um, um, I'm thankful for a team of individuals um, who are thoughtful enough to include the community in a conversation um, because at the end of the day, um, we do not serve ourselves as board members. We serve um, our greatest stakeholder, which is a student. Um, and I do understand that there are concerns on both sides of this regarding health, safety, social distancing. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the ultimate decision of whether students attend schools um, rest in the hands of parents. Um, and because we are forward thinking and we've developed um, our virtual educational platform, we have prepared ourselves for both scenarios. So. Um, I, I commend the superintendent and her teams um, for the work that they've done um, to prepare us 
or the uncertainty of moving into a school year where we're on campus or on a, in a, a, the school year where it's it may be divided, where we have students that are present and students that are virtual and our ability to transform back into a virtual educational um, community if the outside conditions change. So that's it. Thank you, Jonathan. Joan, did you have a want to make a comment? Yes, please. Um, I have had many conversations with friends that are doctors and nurses who have children within the school district, and they are all wanting the schools to reopen. They are all wanting what exactly was stated tonight with protective capacity and distancing within the classrooms. The distancing may be an issue for us to figure out because I don't know how many kids are going to come back and how many parents will keep their kids home. But that may be the safety valve that allows us to do the distancing in classrooms that's needed. But with the masks and with the public health uh, blessing, I, I feel comfortable going ahead with this plan. And I appreciate the work that, that staff has done on this. And I'm hoping that Dr. Matthias will, will weigh in and give his approval shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Any, I think everybody's, uh, Craig, do you wanna make another comment? I had one more short comment. The only area I see we may have work to do is in communicating with the parent and the community. A good, uh, a positive example of good communication was the newsletter that came out today. And I've heard other board members comment on these are things. And if, if we can develop our communication channels, uh, we'll be serving the community um, because uh, that we, we need that. So. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Craig. Um, I just wanna say uh, ditto of what John Silva was saying. I was a little apprehensive about the plan, but after tonight's uh, presentation and thoughtfulness on all the possibilities and the fact that it is a continuum and that there is flexibility, I am feeling much more comfortable uh, with the um, proposal and fully support staff's proposal. And thank you again for all of the work that everyone has put in in this presentation for this evening. Any other uh, comments? Okay, we will move on to um, employee organizational reports. Do we have any, anyone we to do. report? We have FSUDA president, Nancy Dunn. Okay. Okay, I'm ready to go. Good evening, President Honeychurch, members of the board, Superintendent Corey, and community members. I am Nancy Dunn, President of Fairfield Sassoon Unified Teachers Association. I have not taken my turn on the agenda for the past few weeks as we all settled into this virtual world we now work in. I think we are getting more comfortable interacting in this way, so I'm pleased to again be sharing with you on behalf of our members. Today, FSUDA sent out a second survey to learn how our members prioritize the working conditions necessary to reopen schools in August. The survey was sent out to members this morning and we already have 420 responses. At this rate, we will surpass the 552 responses we received on our first survey sent out on June 2nd. As we are all keenly aware, changes happen rapidly. So what is timely and accurate one day can drastically change the next. A few key items from our first survey do bear uh, mentioning nonetheless. First, we, have, we were very pleased with the participation rate of 50% of our bargaining unit with results received across all grade levels and years of experience. At that time, the top three most frequently checked reasonable safety measures were cleaning supplies and hand sanitizer provided in each work area at 92%, daily sanitizing of schools receiving 85%, and wearing of face coverings at 81%. I should mention a scant 1% behind number three is the limiting of visitors to campuses at 
It is encouraging to me to see that all of these reasonable safety measures are also on your list. That gives me hope that we will be able to work cooperatively to negotiate explicit working conditions that will allow our members to return to work safely should circumstances make it possible in August. Also of note in the survey results was data collected on our members' experiences with the effectiveness of distance learning in May. On a scale of one to five, with one being not effective at all and five being very effective, 8% of respondents rated it distance learning as a four or five, meaning effective or very effective. 75% rated its effectiveness as a two or three, 17% rated it as not effective at all. When asked about class and attendance, 24% stated less than a quarter of the students regularly attended and participated, and 19% said that most of the students participated. The remaining 50% responded somewhere in between one quarter and three quarters of their students regularly attended and participated in distance learning in May. We have also completed our member survey on mandatory collaborative planning with 458 members responding, and we will share those results when we bargain next week. Thank you for your time this evening. It's good to be back sharing the thoughts of your certificated employees with you. And we are very much looking forward to working together, making decisions this summer, always wanting to do what is best for students. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Do we have any other uh, organizational reports? No, we do not. Okay. Uh, moving on to F, Chantel Martino, do you have a report? Um, thank you. I'm happy to be here tonight, but I do not have a report. Oh, and we missed all of that because I had my mic <laughs> off. I'm sorry. Thank you, Chantel. It's good to see you virtually is what I said. And we'll move on to superintendent report. Chris Corey. Thank you. I just, are you guys going to be able to fix that? Sorry, I have some reverberation. Got it. Okay. Um, you're going to be hearing later on today about our budget. And I just wanted to mention that the state legislature did pass their state budget. Um, on June 15th, meaning it's constitutional deadline. And unfortunately, there are a lot of disagreements yet between the state legislature and the governor. And so we will see what happens because now the governor has 12 days after receiving SB 74 to either approve the budget bill that was presented to him, approve the budget bill with specific line item reductions or veto the budget and send it back. And so there are gonna be a lot of changes. Again, this happens rather quickly. And so I will continue to keep you abreast because there was quite a discrepancy between the budget that was passed and the governor's May revise. This last Monday, we held our final administrative con uh, council meeting. We did it virtually and we had um, a great turnout. We celebrated some of the year long events. And um, I asked every one of the administrators to submit one picture that uh, made them happy from this, from this past year. And um, I shared it all with the board members. And so um, I believe we're gonna put it out on social media, Martha, yes. Um, tomorrow out on social media, but it's really a great one to watch because there are a lot of smiles and it reminded us that this school year had a lot of great things that happened despite um, the coronavirus. This last week, yesterday, we also had our, our video graduations and hopefully you had a chance to watch them yesterday. They were so professionally done and kudos to um, Tim Gorey and um, Nicole Piazza for their efforts on making this happen 
also our site administrators, they had a lot of work that went into these professional videos, um, but hopefully it was some something special for all of our uh, graduates. In addition, today and yesterday, or this week, we did diploma pickups. And so we had a couple of board members who were able to participate. And what I can tell you is that was a really special event. Uh, kids came in their caps and gowns. They had an opportunity to have their diploma handed to them. There were pictures. Um, it wasn't rushed like our usual graduations where we're saying a name about every other five or every other five seconds. Um, and so it was really special and another wonderful way to celebrate our graduates. It's hard to believe that this year has come to an end. One of the things that we've talked about um, over the last few months is that there's really been no delineation between a work week and a work weekend or a work day and, and an evening. Um, many of our Pete folks have not taken a single day off since that first March 4th when we saw the state of emergency working every day, even on the weekends. We are going to be encouraging our staff to take the first week uh, or the it's the last two days of June and the first week of July, that 4th of July week, and refrain from the emails and try to take a break uh, from the uh, constant workload that has come our way. We know we won't be able to take too long of a break because as we mentioned earlier, things change by, um, by the minute sometimes and we will continue to adjust accordingly. So finally, just look forward to our town hall, our virtual town hall, video town hall meeting on um, next Tuesday at 5.30, where we will answer questions about reopening schools. And if we don't have time to answer all of them during that hour and a half, we will be providing a frequently asked question format on our social media and our website to provide answers as best as we can. And um, just a note, there might be questions that we don't have the answers to as, at this time. You know, we've been saying since March 4th, boy, there's just been a lot of questions and not a lot of answers during this time. And so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to answer the majority of them as we move forward. That ends my report. Thank you, Superintendent Corey. We now move to public uh, comment. This is the opportunity for the public to address items that are not on the board meeting agenda. Public comment is only permitted on matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Um, do we have any public speakers? We do. We have George Gwynn, Michael Bloom, and Miss Tammy. Okay, thank you. That's it. Uh, good evening once again. Um, really um, hope that uh, you guys uh, are going to be teaching uh, true history, uh, at least from here forward. When I was uh, in grade school, uh, it was all sugar coated. It wasn't until I got in high school and college that I found out that a lot of our political leaders weren't the uh, saints that they were portrayed in the earlier grades. Um, I, I think this is really important now because I see a lot of statues are being um, destroyed. Or, oh man, you know, I apologize. For and it's going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money. In addition to that, uh, when you get rid of uh, people that were less than uh, stellar, um, you're doomed to repeating the same history again. A good example is uh, 1989 in uh, China when they had the student that stood in front of a tank. Nowadays, nobody in China knows about that because uh, it's verboten. And the same thing can happen here. Um, another example is uh, Dachau. I don't see anybody trying to tear Dachau down. If it was torn down, then you can have another situation like happened during World War II. And it's so unnecessary and it's, it's such a, a waste of resources. And to, um, doesn't need to happen. So I really hope you guys concentrate on teaching real history and not uh, the sugar-coated stuff. And the other thing I want to talk about is these masks. 
Has anybody thought about that you're rebreathing um, bad air when you have the mask on for a long time? What happens if you guys get sued by people that um, have problems from that? Um, I, I think that um, it's also a problem of people who are getting conditioned to give up their liberties. This is supposed to be a free country, but if you have health de uh, uh, deciding everything, um, it becomes uh, anything but free. So I, I really hope you guys uh, don't let it go to the extreme. We really need to get back to normal very soon. The economy really took a big hit and the longer this thing goes on, the worse it's going to be. So I really hope that uh, you guys are doing everything in your power to make sure that we get back to the way we were before as soon as possible, because otherwise I think we're really in for some bad times. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Bloom. I'm a Spanish teacher from Armio High School. I've been teaching there for about 12 years now. And that is not the thrust of why I'm talking. The reason why I'm talking is because I have a brother who owns three clinics in the Midwest. And I asked him primarily, what are we looking at when we're looking at COVID-19 and my classroom teaching? He said a lot of things. Um, and these things are things I want to share with you all because I've had 12 years of investing my time with the Fairfield community, the FSUSD community, and it concerns me whether or not we're concentrating on what we need to, or whether we're taking certain items lightly. After the presentation, there's some things that were handled thoroughly, but there are others that we need to take a look at. The reality of over 118 thousand people who have died because of COVID in the country. That makes you want to really concentrate on whether or not the percussions are weighed against costs of the economy or whether or not they're weighed against the value of life. National leaders are walking away from the virus as experts say the virus doesn't walk away from us. It's not going away unless it goes away on its own and unless we have a virus uh, that has a shot, a medicine to help uh, stop the virus itself. Now, other things, trends that have been coming up is fatigue over social distancing, fatigue over wearing masks, fatigue over everything else. In the expression of rebellion with that fatigue, you just have a better chance of catching the virus. Best thing we had ever today was Newsom announcing that it is a mandate to wear masks and uh, after you guys had such a detailed presentation, I'm sure you're gonna to have to reword a few words in there to say that you're gonna to have to provide masks to every single student. You're gonna to have to provide masks so that teachers who can't afford it or students who can't afford it have masks provided by the district itself. Sanitation of classrooms, sanitation of restrooms so that bacteria is minimalized and we have less chance of anything connected to that. Uh, is going to lower our ability to do that as well. PPE for teachers, I've already talked about that. Testing. One thing that was not mentioned was COVID-19 testing for teachers and COVID-19 testing for students. I took a test the other day, it was a few minutes, a suave up my nostril, but 72 hours I had results, but at least we will know which teachers are healthy, which teachers should stay home with actual proof from a test. And these should be the determining factors whether or not students come to class. Hello, my name is Tammy. Um, kids call me uh, Miss Tammy. I'm also a parent. It's two subjects that I'm concerned about. Uh, one of them is Black Lives Matter. Um, being culturally sensitive, um, 
um, to the, the children as well as the staff, uh, making sure that <laughs> the students as well as the staff administration, um, they're trained and educated about um, what African Americans have been through. Most are aware, uh, but that there will be some type of training offered. Um, and with that training, um, some of the advantages and disadvantages of being um, African American and teaching um, some of the kids that is not as fortunate as my daughter to teach them to be black and proud. Offer, and also I wanted to know if the district could offer some type of youth employment opportunities for the students in the summer and or some of the adults year round. Because um, some of the schools, they have like two African-Americans, five African-Americans in the whole school. So just being aware of what's going on um, in society right now and how we need to address um, some of the situations by putting people on the campus um, that are aware of some of the things African-Americans have to go through. Um, also the distant learning. Uh, I'm hoping the district will consider um, at least four times three times, two times, one time a month um, for the, um, the kids won't have a shop like they did uh, for this situation. And I'm pretty sure it's gonna be other uh, emergency situations. So at least if we're doing it, at least once a month, the kids will be more familiar on what to do. Um, but we have to put some things into practice. We can't just, it's like driving on the freeway. If you're driving a stick shift, you're not gonna stay in first. Well, we just experienced changing gears. We can't change the gear and then get back on the freeway and drive in first. So that's all I needed to say. God bless. Thank you, Cammie. That concludes our public comment. We'll move on to um, the consent calendar six. Do we have any items to be pulled from the consent calendar? Okay. Um, any public comment on the consent calendar? There's no public comment. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve? I move approval. Thank you. David Isom and Jonathan Seconds. Uh, may I have a roll call, please? Chantal Martino. Aye. John Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Great. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, we move on to action item 11, review and potential approval of the 2020-2021 Local Control and Accountability Plan, federal addendum. There is no presentation. Do we have any public speakers? There are no public speakers. Thank you. Any board uh, discussion? I have a motion to approve. Move approval, John Gott. Thank you. Second. Second, Bethany. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gopp. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Ison. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. That motion carries. We move to B, review and potential approval of the COVID-19 operations written report. Uh, no presentation. Any public speakers? Ms. There are no public speakers. Thank you. Uh, any board discussion on this item? All right. I have a motion. 
Jonathan, did you move approval? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, second. Second, David Ice. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. The motion carries. Moving on to C. Review and potential approval of the 2020-2021 single plans for student achievement for the Title I Comprehensive Support and Improvement and Additional Targeted Support and Improvement Schools. No presentation. Any public speakers? No public speakers. Thank you. Any discussion by the board or questions? I have a motion to approve. Move approval. John Gott. Thank you. Second. Second, John Silva. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Bob. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Doug Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to 12A, review and potential approval of award of RFP 2091-92 Child Nutrition Paper and Supplies to Individual Food Services. No presentation. Any public comment? Ms. Sunny Church, we do not have any public comment submitted for any of the other items. Ah, thank you very much. Any board discussion? May I have a motion to approve? Move approval. Jonathan, second. Second, Bethany. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Going on to be review and potential approval of the adoption of the 2020 2021 annual district budget. Uh, and there is no public comment. I'll turn it over to Linnea Grindle. Thank you, Board President Honeychurch, Governing Board members, and Superintendent Corey. Um, before you this evening is the proposed budget for adoption for the 2020 2021 upcoming school year. As a reminder, this budget is built upon the governor's May revision proposals. And as you recall, uh, we had less than two weeks to put together some significant budget reductions um, as it related to that May revise. Once the state formally adopts its budget, staff will come back and analyze what that means for us locally. And then we have 45 days from that budget adoption for us to make appropriate budget revisions to reflect the changes. And as Superintendent Corey had mentioned earlier, while the state legislature has approved its version of the budget, there are still the ongoing negotiations that are going on between the legislature and Governor Newsom. So once, you know, once again, once the state adopts its budget, we will make the appropriate changes. But at this time, this is the budget that is before you and staff recommends approval of the 2020-2021 budget. Thank you. Any discussion on this item? We have a motion to approve. I move approval with commendations for them working hard to get this to us. Thank you, David. Uh, second? Second, Bethany. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to 13A, review and potential approval of proposed amendment to employment agreement 
for Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, Michelle Henson. Uh, no public comment. Um, do we have any um, discussion from the board? Okay, I have a motion to approve. Move I'll approval, move. Bethany. Okay, is there a second? I second, but I also wanted to say thank you to Michelle for her expert work in keeping these numbers uh, where they are able to be, where we can educate our kids. So thank you, Michelle. And I too want to thank you, Michelle, for your excellent leadership and your fiscal expertise. During the time you've been with us, uh, we have had clear audits and remain fiscally responsible. In these times, that is no easy task. Thank you again for your vital work, Michelle. Roll call. President please. Church, if I could just add. Yes. Just keep in mind, Michelle's not just in charge of the fiscal services. She has the additional responsibilities of transportation, child nutrition, uh, facilities and construction, uh, maintenance and warehouse and, uh, and technology support services. So, Oh. Um, I just want to, I will just want to tell you how much we appreciate her leadership um, in all of those areas. She's just a wonderful um, addition to, or has been a wonderful addition in her, I think five, we're going on five years now um, to the executive cabinet and um, just a fabulous boss and leader. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you for adding that. Roll call, please. Chantel Martino? Aye. Joan Gott? Aye. Judy Honeychurch? Aye. David Ison? Aye. Jonathan Richardson? Aye. John Silva? Aye. Bethany Smith? Aye. Craig Wilson? Thank okay. you. Motion carries. Moving on to B, review and potential approval of proposed amendment to employment agreement for Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, Dr. Sheila McCain. Uh, are there any comments uh, from the board on this item? May I have a motion for approval? Move approval, Bethany. Thank you. Second. Second, David Ison. Thank you. Dr. McCabe, you are an amazing leader. Your community involvement is extraordinary. Thank you so much for your leadership. The important work you do for this district is greatly appreciated. Victoria, <laughs> uh, would you like to add something to that? I would. Um, I just want to thank Dr. McCabe for stepping up into this role. She did just a fabulous job in as the executive director and when this came up and she was willing to step in it's been now three years probably the longest three years of her life um mm -hmm. but i just appreciate her so much there's never a detail that's uh not thought of or research that hasn't been done because she works tirelessly and relentlessly to serve this district in this community and i'm so grateful for her and her expertise Thank you. Roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to C. Review and potential approval of proposed amendment to, of employment agreement for Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Ken Whittemore. Uh, any public, I mean, pardon me, any board discussion on this item? May I have a motion to approve? David Isom of approval. Thank you. Greg Wilson, second. Thank you. Ken, wow, that's all I can say. What you came in, you came to our district September, 2019, and you brought a new brand new set of eyes and perspective to our daily routines here in the district. It has been exceedingly helpful. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment to FSUSD. Ms. Corey? I do have something to add. It just doesn't seem like he's only been with us 
for uh, nine months, I think since September, Ken just immediately uh, joined our team and brought so much to the organization. And we're so grateful for it. Um, we've just heard so many wonderful things from uh, the people he serves, you know, our principals, our site administrators, and our employees who appreciate his personal touch. And he goes out of his way always to be kind and generous. And um, he's already been out in the community. And so it seems like he's been here and I'm going to share a little of his evaluation. But what I wrote in his evaluation that he hasn't seen yet was that it seems like he has the dedication and loyalty to this district of someone who might have been here for decades because he just has really come in with such gusto and um, made our made our district a better place. So thank you, Ken. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Ken Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. I would like to make a little statement right here. I am very pleased with Mr. Whittemore and his level of expertise and knowledge and the way he handles the things that are going on in HR. Thank you so much. And I vote aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. A resounding aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Sova. Aye, aye. Anthony Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to D, a public hearing. Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District's initial proposal to the California School Employees Association Chapter 302 Office Technical Business Services Unit and Support Operations Unit, um, exercising provisions of the collective bargaining agreement to sunshine the successor contracts for July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2023. No presentation. No public speakers. Um, public hearing is open. Ah. Public hearing is closed. Thank you. Uh, e, review and potential approval of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School Official Proposal to the School Employees Association Chapter 32, pardon me, Chapter 302. Um, is there, is there any board discussion on this item? No approval, Bethany. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, John Silva. Roll call, please. Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, moving on to 14A, review and potential approval of resolution number 68-1920, resolution recognizing June 2020 as LGBTQ Pride Month. No presentation. Any board discussion on this item? May I have a motion? Move approval, Bethany. Second. Second. Thank you. I'm uh, sorry. Madam. Go ahead, David. I was trying to, to, to get to the uh un, unmute my phone. I mean my you know my computer. What I what I wanted to, to do is is know if we could read this. Um it won't it won't take long to read it, but I think that if we're going to recognize um people that we ought to read the the the, the, the recognition. Okay. I don't have a copy of the recognition. Um uh, Chris, do you? Dr. Isom, do you have a copy? Yeah, I'm looking at it. Could you read it? Could you Re read it for us, please? Resolution to recognize lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, LG, BTQ Pride Month, June 2020. Whereas, because of acts of courage from those who demanded justice and from those who quietly pushed for progress, our nations made great strides in recognizing what these brave individuals long knew to be true in their hearts that no person should be judged by anything but the content of their character. And whereas the LGBTQ community 
comes together to show pride in Solano County through service and support of the LGBTQ community in partnership with organizations such as Solano Pride Center and whereas we affirm the rights of students and staff to form organizations such as the Gay Straight Alliance, GSA that provides safe spaces and promote inclusion of our LGBTQ students and whereas LGBTQ students who attend inclusive schools and districts are more likely to achieve academic milestones, have lower rates of absenteeism and experience less harassment. And whereas during LGBTQ Pride Month, we celebrate how far we've come and reaffirm our steadfast belief in the equal dignity and right to education for all. And whereas the governing board of the Fairfield Unified School District proudly stands with their LGBTQ community staff faculty and students as they strive for acceptance, visibility, safety, affirmation, and equitable opportunity in the quest for full equality. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the governing board of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District does hereby proclaim June 2020 as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer pride month has and adopted, hopefully, this 18th day of June 2020 by the governing board of the Fairfield Sassoon Unified School District by the following vote. I just wanted to read that because it speaks to so much that we're going through as a nation today. Exactly. Right. Right. Thank you for reading that. That was that was the right thing to do. May I have a roll call, please? Chantal Martino. Aye. Joan Gop. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Anthony Smith. Aye. Craig Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. We are on to 20A written report, uh, facility subcommittee meeting minutes from the June 9th, 2020 meeting. No presentation, any board discussion. We are at our adjournment, 21A. May I have a motion to adjourn? Move approval. Okay. okay. Jonathan and Bethany seconds. Uh, roll call, please. Chantel Martino. Aye. Joan Gott. Aye. Judy Honeychurch. Aye. David Isom. Aye. Jonathan Richardson. Aye. John Silva. Aye. Bethany Smith. Aye. Greg Wilson. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>